Welcome back to the bulletin. Let's begin now with part of the news in detail. Pakistan's foreign minister, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, has said that Pakistan backs the Afghan peace process on a principle of non-interference. He was speaking to the Lahore Conference for Afghan Peace, which is being held at the Hill Resort of Bourbon. The foreign minister said a common enemy has harmed relations between Kabul and Islamabad. He said the Afghan crisis has badly affected Pakistan and people need to end the blame game. Over 50 leaders representing 18 political parties, including Gulbuddin Hikmatyar and Ustad Atanur, are attending. Afghan Amman Jirga, Chief Karim Khalili and Uzbek leader Rashid Dostum are also taking part in the talks. The conference will review Afghan security, its future and repatriation of Afghan refugees from Pakistan. Detailed discussions on trade communication, health and other sectors will be included. The foreign minister has also said that obviously a common enemy has harmed relations between Kabul and Islamabad. He said the Afghan crisis badly affected Pakistan and people should obviously end the blame game. Now, at the conference, over 50 leaders representing 18 political parties, including, as I said, Gulbuddin Hikmat Yar and Ustad Atar Noor, were in attendance. Afghan Aman Jirga, Chief Karim Khalili, and Uzbek leader Rashid Dostum are also taking part in the talks. Now, the conference had reviewed Afghan security, its future, and repatriation of Afghan refugees from Pakistan. Now, for more on this, we are joined by our correspondent, Isar Nugvi. So, Isar, number one, where does this conference fit into the larger scheme of the Afghan peace process? Uh, well, um, uh, we've seen that this conference has just begun and it is not being hosted exactly by the government of Pakistan. It is being hosted by uh, the center, Lahore Center for Peace and Research. Uh, but... The foreign minister of Pakistan, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, was here a little while ago and he said this, that if this conference is able to create that environment, then definitely Pakistan could possibly in future uh, also invite Taliban and other stakeholders, including the political leadership from Afghanistan for formal talks in Islamabad or somewhere in Pakistan. So definitely this process, which has just started and has its participation with from more than uh, 18 political parties with more than 50 representatives from Afghanistan, it definitely is going to create an impact. Right. Now, we know that the Doha uh, talks uh, conference were cancelled. So are delegates expected to discuss the resumption of the intra-Afghan talks? Well, uh, this conference, as we see, has provided all the Afghan leadership a platform. Uh, since there was a disconnect after this uh, scuttling of the Doha talks, uh, there was a disconnect between, like, among the uh, Afghan leadership. Now, this is the platform where all uh, leaders from different political parties in Afghanistan, they are present in Ghurban which is near Islamabad, and they are discussing their viewpoint on taking forward the Afghan peace process. So definitely, it also is a platform where uh, the resumption of uh, an intra-Afghan dialogue will also be discussed. Right. Thank you, Isa. That was Isa Nagvi joining us from Islamabad. Now, let's move on. In the struggle between the world's two biggest economies, the U.S. has blacklisted another five Chinese tech companies companies, preventing them from buying U.S.-made chips and components. The U.S. Commerce Department says that the company's activities pose a national security threat. The stocks of U.S. chip makers fell in response to the announcement. In a legal development, the Chinese tech giant Huawei has filed a lawsuit against the Commerce Department over the seizure of its equipment. Washington says the Chinese company's telecommunications kit could be used for spying by Beijing. China denies the allegations. Meanwhile, the United States is to increase its deportations of asylum seekers back to Mexico and Cuba. The operation against illegal migrants will be launched on Sunday, targeting 2,000 families in 10 U.S. cities. Now, advocates for migrants say they're concerned that asylum seekers have little access to legal counsel. Now, they could be sent to the Mexican border cities, which have some of the highest homicide rates in the world. 
The Director of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Mark Morgan, says families already sent a removal order will be deported first. The Trump administration plans to expand the program to remove frivolous asylum claims. The measures are, however, being challenged in courts. Next, Russia has temporarily banned its airlines from flying to Georgia after unrest in the country. The ban comes after 240 people were hurt in protests against the appearance of a Russian MP in Georgia's parliament. Moscow is advising Russian travel agencies to suspend all tours to neighboring Georgia. Tensions between the countries remain high 11 years after fighting a war over the disputed South Ossetia region. Georgian President Salome Zurashvili earlier blamed Moscow for the recent violence. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev is calling the allegation a distortion of reality. The head of Georgia's parliament, Irakli Kobachidze, has resigned after the peace crackdown on the protests. Opposition leaders say they will hold demonstrations until the parliament is dissolved and snap elections are called. Right, and with that, we're going to take another break, but don't go anywhere. More stories to follow. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now, Sri Lanka has extended the state of emergency imposed after the Easter Sunday attacks for at least another month. President Maithripala Sirisena says that he invoked the provisions of the Public Security Act in response to the ongoing emergency. Now, the tough laws grant sweeping powers to police and security forces to arrest and detain suspects. The measures were due to expire today. Now, earlier, Sirisena had said that the security situation is back to normal. President Donald Trump says he blocked planned U.S. military strikes against Iran in response to the shooting down of a spy drone. President Trump said in a series of tweets that he aborted the air raids 10 minutes before the planned strikes on three different sites in Iran. Trump said he changed his mind when he was told that 150 Iranians will be killed in the attack. The U.S. president warned that Iran would face obliteration if conflict broke out. He said the U.S. is in no hurry to attack Iran because more sanctions have been imposed. He added that Iran would not be allowed to obtain nuclear weapons. Foreign Minister Javad Zarif said Iran has retrieved parts of the U.S. military drone from its territorial waters. Now, for more on this story, we have with us Hamid Raza Ghulam Zadeh. For more updates on this story, he's a political analyst in Tehran. So first of all, Hamid, can you tell me why did President Donald Trump reverse the order to strike Iran? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Actually, it seems to me that it is more a bluff rather than a uh, true uh, decision made by President Trump because he has said that just 10 minutes before the uh, attack. I thought that when the when uh, the interview area actually asked him, uh, so you mean that planes were on there and the everything was ready? He said, no, not 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 that ready. We were for an attack. So if you want to attack somewhere in ten minutes, you at least need to have some fighter jets on an air. Uh, and moreover, he says that because of 150 civilian uh, lives that were in danger, he decided to cancel the flight, the, the attack. So it seems that for a country which has killed uh, thousands and thousands of people in different countries, in different regions, uh, 150 is not a uh, good number, enough number to stop an attack. Uh, the point is that the Americans seem to understand that the Iran had the right actually to attack the uh, drone and because it was in, in all its uh, space. And because of that, they uh, don't have enough evidence and enough reasons to counterattack. 
So because of that, they are trying just to justify their inaction and their, their uh, not to know retaliation that they are not showing. Right so now, Amir, the, the, I mean, there's, uh, this all stems, of course, from the recent attack on the oil tankers. Uh, what do you make of that accusation made by President Donald Trump, which has led to all of this happening? That's a similar case because uh, we are in a post with era and with, with President Trump in office, we have it intensified that they are trying to sell uh, their own narrative as, as reality and as truth to the public opinion. They just claim that the Iran is responsible for the tanker attack. Uh, one, they didn't provide any evidence. And we have seen that in many countries, like, for example, Germany, Japan, and many other countries have cast doubt uh, about the evidence I asked the United States to provide uh, real evidence that Iran was involved. And they have failed to do that, of course, because it seems that it was not true at all. So uh, it, the, the claims that the Americans are uh, raising against Iran are all based on no evidence. And we saw that in the, this recent case, Iran provided the coordinates of GPS coordinates for the location, the, the remains of the uh, drone, and all the evidence that was possible and was given to them. The route that the drone had flighted had to be on the other side, you cannot see any uh, accurate information being uh, distributed by Americans. And right. They, Thank you, yeah. Hamid Reza Ghulam Zadeh. That was Hamid Reza Ghulam Zadeh joining us uh, from Tehran. He's a political analyst there. Let's move on now. Some of the world's leading airlines have suspended operations over the Straits of Hormuz. Flights have been rerouted since Iran shot down a U.S. drone in the area. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration has ordered U.S. carriers to avoid flying over the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman. The suspensions will affect thousands of passengers. The Emirates Airlines is rerouting flights away from areas of possible conflict in the Gulf region. British Airways says it will follow the FAA guidance, while Dutch flag carrier KLM is no longer flying over the Straits of Hormuz. German air carrier Lufthansa has stopped flying over parts of Iran. Diverting flights into longer routes around the region will raise airline fuel costs, which could be passed on to passengers. Next, a bomb explosion in a mosque in eastern Baghdad has killed at least seven people and injured more than 20. The explosion occurred in the Baladiyat neighborhood. Police say either a suicide belt or improvised explosive device was used in the attack. No group has yet claimed responsibility. At least 13 Palestinians have been wounded by Israeli forces firing rubber-coated steel bullets at protesters on the Gaza border. Hundreds of protesters took part in the weekly Great March of Return demonstration. The recurring demonstrations aim to end Israel's blockade of the Gaza Strip. More than 300 Palestinians have been killed and over 23,000 others injured by Israeli forces since the start of March in protests last year. Mauritanians will take part in the country's first democratic presidential elections today. Voters will choose between six candidates wanting to succeed President Mohamed Ould Abdelaziz. The leading contender is Mohamed Ould Ghazouani, a close associate of President Aziz and a former defense minister. President Aziz is standing down after almost 10 years in power because of constitutional term restrictions. Now, official figures say at least one and a half million Mauritanians are eligible to vote. If there is no outright winner in today's ballot, a runoff will be held on July the 6th. Mauritania faces challenges from armed groups and under development. It has never had a peaceful transfer of power since independence from France in 1960. President Nicolas Maduro says his meeting with UN rights chief Michel Bachelet will improve ties between Caracas and the United Nations. Bachelet, during her three-day visit to Caracas, met President Maduro and opposition leader Juan Guaido. Maduro says he will consider recommendations made by the UN to solve the country's humanitarian crisis. Bachelet says two UN delegates will monitor Venezuela's human rights situation. She says a Human Rights Commission office will be established in the country.
Now at the European Union summit, EU leaders have warned Britain's divorce deal cannot be changed, regardless of who becomes the country's next prime minister. European Council President Donald Tusk says the bloc will remain patient despite the political drama unfolding in Westminster. He says EU leaders are looking forward to working with the next British Premier. European Commission head Jean-Claude Juncker says there is a consensus among the leaders not to renegotiate the withdrawal agreement. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez says new names should be put forward for the EU top job. Discussions among leaders are set to continue at the Group of 20 summit in Japan and at another EU summit in Brussels next week. Now, the United Nations has adopted a new treaty against violence and harassment at the workplace. The agreement, inspired by the women's Me Too movement, has been approved by the International Labour Organization. The convention was agreed by a wide margin on the final day of the ILO's annual conference. The Me Too movement was sparked by sexual abuse allegations in Hollywood in 2017. The treaty aims to protect workers from harassment, irrespective of their contractual status. Now to Germany, tens of thousands of climate activists and students have rallied to demand action against global warming in the western city of Aachen. At least 20,000 young activists from 17 countries flocked to Aachen near the Dutch and Belgian borders. The activists block access to two coal power stations for the weekend. They accused Germany of not doing enough to combat climate change. The protesters called on Berlin to start wind down its coal consumption and implement greener policies. The event is part of the Fridays for Future movement started by Swedish student Greta Thunberg. The campaign has spread internationally and events takes place every Friday across European cities. A hungry, shiny black beetle is chewing its way through swathes of forest in northern Greece. The pest has already bitten through at least 100,000 trees. There's more food for thought in this report. Shiny black beetles have created a huge environmental challenge for Greece. The insects are destroying the country's woodland at a rapid pace. The green pine forests are fast turning brown. Many factors, including protracted periods of drought in the summer months, resulted in low vitality of the trees. Experts said the attack is uncontrollable at the moment. The problem is unfortunately very big at the moment because the insect is moving almost uncontrollably. We have to take the appropriate measures with precision logging to stop its momentum. Environment specialists said that authorities must remove dead and infected trees to mitigate the effects. The way to deal with it is the removal of dead and primarily the infected trees because it remains there. The insect has already left the dead trees so we must remove the infected ones so that no more new insects appear. The beetle is known to exist in Greece since the 1970s but no serious effort was made to eliminate. Now, first up, in the world of business, gold prices have struck a near six-year high as a weaker dollar and escalating U.S.-Iran tension have fueled a flight to safe assets. The precious metal has soared nearly 5% just this week. Crude oil prices were also up 0.9% on the back of the Middle East tensions. U.S. crude oil futures were up 0.68% at $57.46 per barrel after rallying more than 5% the previous day. U.S. stocks have opened lower as rising geopolitical tensions kept investors on edge. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 0.02% at the open. The S&P 500 opened lower by 0.05%, while the Nasdaq Composite dropped 0.28% at the start of the trading day. 
Well, that was all we have from our news bulletin at the moment. But do stay tuned to Indus News for more updates. Thanks for watching.